Okay, well, thank you so much for joining us here today. Um, I will just dive right into it. Um, so welcome, welcome to the forums at MPAC, the Muslim Public Affairs Council, an organization aimed at impacting public policy and public opinion involving Islam and Muslims. My name is Prema Rahman, I'm the MPAC Policy Analyst, and joining me here today is co-moderator, MPAC Policy Intern, Leela Kaladi. Um, I'm so honored to be with experts here today addressing the growing threat of white supremacy globally. The evolving th threat has existed for decades, but exactly 10 years ago today, to this day, the globe watched the tipping point for attacks such as the Charleston Church Massacre and the Christchurch shooting. We at Unpack are working at the forefront of this issue as we have called on institutions like the FBI and Department of Homeland Security to acknowledge the clear, persistent, and global threat of white supremacy and create an equitable definition of terrorism. To give a brief, a brief bit of context on the attack that happened 10 years ago, although I know our panelists will elaborate further as we move forward. In 2011, Andres Brevik was responsible for killing 77 people where he specifically targeted children of liberal Norwegian politicians who embraced Muslim immigrants. Brevik soon became an icon and role model for an international subculture of white nationalism ranging from those who troll online to those motivated to commit violence, political or otherwise. The attack in Oslo was a clear catalyst for the growth of transnational white supremacist violence. Today, I'm joined here by three leading experts on this issue. With that, I'll hand it over to Leela to introduce our panelists. First, we have Daryl Johnson, who is one of the most foremost experts on domestic terrorism in the United States. Beginning his career as a civilian in the US Army, Johnson has held several government positions, most recently a senior analyst at the Department of Homeland Security. He's the owner of DT Analytics, a private consulting firm, and he is the author of Hateland, a long hard look at America's extremist heart and right-wing resurgence, how domestic terrorism threat is being ignored. In 2009, Johnson issued a briefing on right-wing extremism, but it was ignored. Resources were redirected to studying Islamic extremism and Johnson's concerns about right-wing extremism as a threat within the United States and globally were pushed out of the Department of Homeland Security. Now it is clear today that if the US government had listened to Johnson's advice then, there would be fewer extremists and fewer attacks. Daryl Johnson joins us today to discuss the history of white supremacy in the United States and what we can do now to combat this rising threat. Daryl, thank you so much for joining us today. Next, we have Sindra Bongstad, who is a social anthropologist based in Norway and works as a researcher for the Institute of Church, Religion and Worldview Research in Oslo. Bongstad has a background in ethnographic research on Muslims in South Africa and Norway and has published in leading international scholarly journals. He is the author of Anders Brevik and the Rise of Islamophobia and The Politics of Mediated Presence, exploring the voices of Muslims in Norway's mediated public spheres. His recent work in the anthropology of law and human rights explores racism and Islamophobia and the intersections between free speech and hate speech with particular reference to the case of Norway. He will be an incoming professor at Princeton University in the fall of 2022. We welcome Dr. Bongstad to our discussion today. Um, last but not least, we have Torkel Brecke, uh, who is the Dep Deputy Director and Research Professor at the Peace Research Institute of Oslo. He is also a research theme leader at the Center for Research on Extremism at the University of Oslo and works part-time at a liberal think tank, Civitia. He is a dis he has distinguished himself on public debate on immigration and pluralism, as well as research policy. We welcome Dr. Brecke today on our 10 year anniversary of the attacks in Oslo, as he offers very important insight um, on the transnational element of white supremacy and what Norway has done to combat this threat since the attacks. Dr. Brecke has pr prepared a presentation for us today. So I'd like to open up the floor for him now. Um, Dr. Brecke, take it away. Thank you very much, Lila. That's very kind words. Uh, really delighted uh, and honored to, um, to be here talking to you guys. Um, uh, uh, let's see if I can uh, share my screen with you. Um, let's see. Mm. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so can you see um, the uh, 10 years after the 22nd July? Um, right, so um, I speak today um, as part of uh, something called the CREX, the Center for Research on Extremism, uh, which is based at the University of Oslo. Uh, which is a main um, hub for research on, uh, on extremism and particularly on right-wing extremism. And uh, um, I am going to just say a few words about the, what, what happened on the 22nd July. And I'm going to continue by talking a little bit about the kinds of research that we do at CREX and uh, particularly the um, uh, research uh, projects and, and publications that I think could be of particular relevance for the uh, discussion and debate today. So it's it's a very special day, it's an emotionally charged day today for many Norwegians because um, many of us uh, either knew people who were killed or injured at uh, ten years ago, or, or or you know families who lost their loved ones um, because it was of course a very large scale attack um, and. Uh, and today we have seen a lot of different types of commemoration and, and speeches and so on. So what happened, um, let's see, I'm trying to change the slides here. Um, oh, here we go. So this is just a brief timeline, just to remind you of what happened. And um, I think that the most important uh, point is the last ones, that uh, particularly the, the, the time. Uh, this is something that we have been discussing a lot. Um, the time it took for the police to arrive at Utøya uh, after the first shots were fired. Um, um, these times may not be exact, particularly the, the first one, but uh, we know that the terrorists started actually by sending out a compendium, um, uh, a text that he had written, a, a long text uh, stating his uh, reasons for doing what he did, which is basically a, a highly inconsistent um, cut and paste text uh, about uh, immigration and the breakdown of European civilization and the need to uh, to act and to start a war to to save a European civilization. Uh, we know the results. Um, what came immediately after this was um, a realization that Norway had in no way been prepared on any level uh, for this kind of uh, uh, crisis or this kind of attack. And um, immediately after the attacks, the government uh, set down a committee led by uh, a woman called Alexandra Beck Jörv. Um, and then one year after the, the attack, this commission gave their report, a Jörv report, and here, uh, I just want to share with you briefly the main conclusions of this uh, report. As we can see, um, we all realized that um, uh, the police handling of the situation was, uh, was uh, faulty. Um, uh, the commission uh, explained that the attack on, on the government complex could have been prevented uh, and a number of things could have been done to, to actually stop the terrorists before this happened. A number of uh, measures having to do with intelligence work, with the awareness, of course, of right-wing, uh, the threat from right-wing terrorism in, in Norway, et cetera, et cetera. One positive note was that, um, as you can see in bullet point four, um, the health health workers and the local hospitals uh, actually managed their job fairly well. And this has been described in, in research in, in international journals. Uh, this was mainly due to, uh, to training, good training, 
uh, and uh, being able also to, to innovate uh, as the injured um, youth came in in, in, uh, in large numbers on that day. But um, let's see. I have problems. Uh, I'm sorry, Lila. I have problems with um, with uh, changing the slide. Oh, here we go. Sorry. So, so uh, basically, what Norwegians are stuck with after the attacks um, is this, uh, uh, or I mean, what is left concerning the handling, the police handling of the attack, is this picture. This is a photo of the uh, boat carrying the uh, special police force that arrived uh, at Utaya. And, and they brought their own boat, which did not work, which um, uh, were, which was um, uh, did not have the, the right dimensions, and and also had some engine problems. And this caused uh, the rescue operation to be delayed, and probably um, several uh, young people could have been saved if they had been faster. So this is this is sort of stuck in the. In the mind of the Norwegian public, as the the picture of the failure on that uh, on that afternoon. So um, now I'm going to talk a little bit about the the research that we have been doing at um, CREX, the Center for Research on Extremism, about uh, the 22nd of July attacks. Uh, so what do we know about the uh, about the uh, actual uh, attacks and, and, and particularly what do we know about the impacts, the influence of, of uh, Breivik and, and his uh, ideology and his uh, actions on um, why the far right circles. I think uh, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about this simply because I think it's a good point of departure for some of the things that we will be discussing. Recently, CREX um, um, came out with, with a special issue in a journal called Perspectives on Terrorism, um, devoted to the 22nd July attacks 10 years after. And um, I'll say a couple of words uh, on some of the articles from this uh, special issue, just to uh, just to tell you a little bit about what, what we have been researching and what we know. If you look at bullet point two, um, Breivik's long shadow, question mark, the impact of the July 22nd attacks on the modus operandi of extreme right law and active terrorists. Here, um, my colleagues at CRX ask to what extent the terror attacks on July 22nd have influenced um, later extreme right law uh, uh, lone actor terrorists in the way they conduct themselves. And the, the general answer is that the in influence has been quite limited. There was some speculation, or actually many, many people believed that the Christchurch um, shooter, March 2019, was influenced uh, quite substantially by Breivik, and, and he said many things to that uh, effect himself. But um, in this article, the authors show that this is partly, uh, partly laying a false trail by the Christchurch uh, terrorists. So, so if you look at the contents and the, and the target selection and the, a number of, of sort of dimensions, we, we see that uh, many of the later attackers who claim influence from Breivik actually behave quite differently and they select very different targets, they, they have very different uh, uh, ideas about um, broadcasting uh, their actions. Uh, instead of writing a long, long semi philosophical uh, book, they would rather um, stream it online and so on. So, so um, uh, that's an interesting article. If, if you look at bullet point three, monster or hero, that is perhaps even more interesting. Um, so, so 
the title here is Monster or Hero? Far-right responses to Anders Bering Breivik um, and, um, and the July 22nd terrorist attacks. And here the authors uh, uh, use online methods trying to measure the influence um, or, or, or rather the acceptance or non-acceptance of uh, Breivik among various types of far-right um, actors uh, and organizations. And they find that if you look at Western Europe, all radical right parties rejected uh, and condemned Breivik. Also, all if, if you still look at Western Europe, all, all anti-Islamic organizations also rejected his um, uh, his actions, uh, and many of them also re rejected his, his ideas. So uh, the, the people who embraced Breivik uh, or, uh, you know, um, who, who uh, admire him uh, are actually to be found on anonymous uh, Chan, uh, Chan boards. Um, they are to be found in Chan subcultures in siege subculture, um, and they are uh, more numerous in um, in Russia, but also partly in the USA rather than in Western Europe. So, so, so the authors here ask why why have the radical right um, in terms of parties and, and movements uh, largely rejected Breivik in Western Europe, and, and they explain this by. Uh, claiming that there is um, uh, there is a, a taboo, a cultural taboo on violence in Western Europe. Why? While this taboo is less strong in a place like Russia uh, and also perhaps in the USA. So we can discuss that later. Okay. So um, moving on, uh, finally to the to the uh, bullet point four: consensus of conflict. That is a very interesting uh, article, in my view, because it 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 is the best uh, to date, the best um, research that we have on how Norwegian society, uh, how the Norwegian population understand in, and interpret the attacks um, ten years ago, and uh, we know that the the then prime minister uh, Jens Stoltenberg immediately said that he wanted to meet the attack with more openness, more democracy, and so on. But the question is, uh, do the population share this narrative, this approach to, to, to the attacks? And so um, colleagues at CREX sent out a representative survey um, where they asked people um, uh, about their opinions on uh, who was targeted uh, in the attacks, what were the causes of the attack, uh, what were the reactions, social and political reactions to the attack, and what were their own emotional and cognitive reactions uh, and awareness. And if you look at this uh, slide, we can see that there are three different narratives in Norway about what happened 10 years ago. Um, uh, on, on, on the right hand side of the screen, you see democracy, um, and this is the most dominant narrative. This is the narrative and the story, you might say, about the attacks that was um, launched by the then prime minister. Um, uh, and the main core of that narrative is to say that it was Norwegian democracy as such that was attacked, uh, although, of course, it was the labor youth movement that was attacked specifically. It was also, uh, and most importantly, an attack on Norwegian democracy and state in institutions. And that narrative is very often associated with the attitude that Norway handled the attacks well, uh, and also that values uh, got stronger after the attacks, and this uh, is actually the narrative that is that has most support in the Norwegian population ten years after. But you have two very different uh, narratives. If you see in the middle here, you have a diversity narrative, claiming that 
what was attacked was um, uh, mainly multicultural Norway, diverse Norway. It was a racist attack. It was an attack on the left wing and the Labour Party. And uh, if you look at the cause, um, I mean, these narratives, if you look at the left hand, uh, if you, the left side here, you see the main components of each narrative, uh, the cause, the target, and the aftermath. And the, the diversity narrative um, is associated with uh, an idea that the cause, of course, uh, of, of the attack was right-wing extremism, while the democracy narrative is not that interested in looking for the causes. That it's, it's more uh, likely to claim that, you know, the causes are, uh, there are multiple causes, it's, it's about insanity and so on, uh, while the uh, diversity narrative uh, is very interested in, in the ideology. And this is, um, um, uh, this is also a, an important narrative with, with a lot of support. The most problematic narrative is the one to the left here, which is called a far right narrative. Um, and that is a narrative about the attacks, which, has, which claims that the main cause of the attack was immigration policy. That in a sense that the Labour Party itself was uh, to blame because they had opened the borders for immigration. Uh, and it, it is also a claim that um, the target was not necessarily a political target, but that um, and uh, most importantly, at the bottom here, that the Labour Party has later exploited the attacks uh, in order to, to uh, restrict debates and so on. And, and this far right narrative is typically held by, well, people on the far right, basically. Um, and it has the support uh, of the full support of 8%. Uh, and some support among 19%. So, so it's quite, um, quite, quite a big chunk of the population, although the democracy uh, narrative is, is clearly uh, the most important. Okay, so uh, let's, I'm going to um, just give you a very quick idea of other types of research that is going on in Norway. There's a lot of research on victims and families hosted by something called the Norwegian Center for Violence, Violence and Traumatic, tra Traumatic Stress Studies. There is, secondly, quite a lot of uh, interesting research on media uh, and the way that the media has handled um, the attacks, and not least by uh, at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology. Uh, there's a big res uh, research project on national values and how they have changed or, or been stable after the attacks. Uh, and there's, uh, there's um, a lot of interesting research on Islamophobia. Um, and uh, there's uh, particularly a, a research project called Intersect, Intersecting Flows of Islamophobia, hosted by the Norwegian School of Theology, Religion and Society which I started together with um, uh, Professor Islin Frieden. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to stop there uh, with a picture of, uh, of uh, the crowds uh, carrying roses um, just after the attacks um, 10 years ago. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Bretke. Um, I actually, as you were presenting, I had a couple of questions emerge and this can be open for pretty much all of our panelists as well. Um, so Dr. Bangsta, Daryl, if you would like to answer as well, please feel free to jump in. Um, first of all, let me just by let me just start off by saying thank you so much for that presentation. I am glad I have a copy of it, and I, uh, if should anyone um, of our viewers would like to access it, would we be able to share it with them, Dr. Brecker? Yeah, Excellent. certainly. Yeah. Thank you. Um, that way, then we can we can make a note to share um, share it as a recap on our event. Then, so thank you so much for that. So I wanted to quickly just make note that the democracy narrative you shared was very much interesting because that is something. And Daryl, I think you can speak more on this. 
I think that that primarily had been the narrative that we were seeing um, when white supremacist attacks were being carried out. I know that throughout most of the 2010s, whenever such attacks happened, it tended to get the lone wolf narrative rather than calling it what it is, which is you know an act of terrorism carried out by white supremacist violence um, or racially motivated violent extremists, RMVEs as we say here. Um, so that being said, I would like to ask two questions then on this presentation. So the failure, um, is that the failure that you noted um, from the Norwegian police, is that due to the perceived threat level of the Norwegian government attached to white nationalist attacks, would that have been the case if this attack was carried out by someone, say, of Muslim background? Uh, um, I, I hope, I'm not sure I understood your question, but, but it, I think you asked if, if uh, the police intelligence was uh, um, unaware of the threat from, from right-wing extremism. And I think that was the case. It was too little awareness, mm -hmm. uh, it, uh, certainly. And, and the focus was clearly on jihadist terrorism, uh, which of course has been a major threat in Europe, particularly in France and Germany, as we know. Um, so yes, there was too little awareness, but, but the failures was also very much technical failures about the way that police work is coordinated in a crisis situation. Uh, it's, so it's a lot about coordination and, and, and making uh, an operational and tactical level police work uh, is very much, uh, but, but yes, there, there's also in, an, uh, a big dimension of intelligence work in, in, the, in the commission report um, that failed to, to, to have this type of threat on the radar, oh, uh, obviously, yes. Can, can I just jump in here? Um, because um, I, I, I think that uh, in, in the specific Norwegian context, it's, it's important to say this now. This was not uh, 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 an attack on all Norwegians. This was a, an attack which targeted Norwegian social democrats and Norwegian social democratic youth in particular. And it's important to say that because of the very fact that the then Prime Minister, Jan Stoltenberg, of the Social Democratic Labour Party, uh, who was at the time in his uh, third and last period as a Prime Minister of Norway, uh, he's now the NATO Secretary General. Um, uh, the terrorist attacks uh, presented him uh, and the Labour Party in government with a conundrum. Uh, on the one hand, in, in the face of such a crisis, you need to uh, put up messages that uh, uh, cre create a sense of national unity, right? But what that meant was that it, it came at the, the cost of a profound reckoning in Norweg uh, Norwegian society and in Norwegian politics uh, with uh, right-wing extremism in this country. And uh, I, I must say that <clears throat> in the context of the present Norwegian debate, I'm, I'm extremely encouraged by the very fact that the survivors from the massacre at Utøya, uh, young Labour Party youth activists, uh, have taken the lead at significant cost to themselves, because these are people who not only deal with severe trauma, 10 years on, but they also experience one out of three survivors from Utrecht, according to uh, trauma sur surveys, have faced uh, hate messages and death threats on account of their very speaking in public. So we need to be clear about this, the very fact that this was a, a fascist attack, right? The assumption was and the, uh, the Islamophobic element here is clear. Norway at the time had a Muslim population of three, four point uh, percent of the population. Uh, one of the motivating ideas of uh, Anders Bering Breivik, uh, the perpetrator, who was a white Norwegian from 
uh, upper class areas in Oslo West, the Norwegian capital, uh, was that uh, Muslims in Norway uh, had come to Norway in order to take over uh, Norway and to establish basically an Islamic state or a caliphate, right? Which is on the face of it, it's an absolutely ludicrous idea, uh, of, of, of course. But um, I, I do think that, you know, if we look at the wider patterns over time here, and, and I feel that there's also a need to say this, Norway has never experienced any terrorist attacks perpetrated by Muslims. All terrorist attacks throughout modern Norwegian history has been perpetrated by right-wing extremists, right? So the, uh, the, the terror we experienced 10 years ago on this very date was highly and, and thoroughly political, right? And, and there's no doubt about it. When we look at, at Breivik's impact, and, and this is you know, also important to, to point out, uh that it, it might be the case that uh uh the christ church uh killer who attacked a mosque two mosques in in christ church in new zealand and killed some 50 muslim uh in 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 prayer uh may not have copied uh breivik's uh you know modus operando uh you know, as, as, as sort of using it as a, uh, as a as a blueprint, as it were. Uh, but we know from uh, Breivik's cut and paste track that one of his first ideas for a terrorist attacks involved attacking Norwegian Muslims celebrating Eid, right? Who did that in on 10th of August 2019 in Norway? Well, uh, that was one Philip Monsos uh a norwegian white uh, right-wing extremist like breivik from upper class areas uh in and around oslo uh fortunately he didn't succeed but that was only because he was out overpowered by uh, two uh extremely courageous muslim pakistani men in their uh, 70s who managed to hold him down until the police arrived um uh, and so we we also need to take account of of of, of this when speaking uh, about the challenges we we face and, and these are by now global challenges we face in common i think there's no doubt uh by now that norway much like the us has underplayed uh the threat of of uh, right-wing extremism uh and and to its great regret i have a couple of perspectives from you know in the american united states side uh, related to torkel's uh, presentation we see the exact same thing when the uh, the capital attack happened okay intelligence wasn't shared there was also a tactical component where the capital police underestimated the threat that these individuals uh, pose to the Capitol building and the legislators lo located there. So it's a combination, whenever we have these attacks, it's usually a combination of factors. You know, intelligence wasn't uh, adequate enough, but the police were not prepared, whether it was training equipment, uh, you know, and then you have, as Torkel pointed out, this communications issue. Uh, we saw that same exact thing with the U.S. Capitol insurrection, where we had the Capitol Police who were outnumbered and being overpowered. They called on the military for assistance, and it took the military, you know, half a day uh, to get troops there to help protect the Capitol and our democracy. Uh, the other thing I would say um, related to Torkel's presentation, it was spot on with those three perspectives, the far right narrative, uh, the diversity narrative, and then the government's narrative. We see the same exact pattern here in America. And unfortunately, like Torkel says, 
this costs people's lives because our own government fails to acknowledge the threat. They dismiss it as a crazed gunman or a hate crime or just somebody snapped and did this. They don't talk about the belief system that motivated that person to choose that target and to carry out an act of violence. And so, you know, that's been part of my crusade here in America is to educate the American people on this disparity and try to encourage our government leaders to take a stand. And one other last thing I'll say is our own, you know, political party, the Democrats, which could be somewhat equated to the Labor Party in Nor Norway, uh, they've come to the table and condemn these types of attacks. It's the Republicans. OK, these are the guys in political power that need to take a leadership role in condemning this. And to this point, they haven't. Um, and so I've been calling them out. Uh, the fact that, you know, they're cowards um, and it all boils down to political power. Um, they don't want to call out these attacks as terrorism for fear of losing votes from their own constituents that support similar views of these extremists. Uh, so, unfortunately, that's, you know, what I've learned. And, and just going off of that, Daryl, could you maybe speak to um, what you saw in 2009 when you issued that briefing and sort of the history of what white supremacy has looked like over the course of 10 years? Sure. So, you know, as you said in your introduction, I wrote an intelligence assessment warning that uh, the political landscape was going to change with the unprecedented election of the first black president, coupled with a downturn in the economy, just created this fertile ground of recruits into these far right groups because they like to exploit, you know, political issues, social issues, economic issues, and try to point blame on, you know, different stereotypes and things of this nature. And so I put out this warning, uh, which I felt was prescient and predicted accurately a threat that was on the horizon. And what happened uh, to my surprise was my political or my uh, intelligence report was leaked for political purposes. And it was spun by the Republicans and conservatives against the incoming Democratic administration. And because the new administration was kind of caught off guard by this, they were still in the middle of appointing people uh, to various cabinet positions and things of this nature. Um, the Republican message or narrative, even though it was flawed and manipulated and full of lies, uh, that's what took root until I went public in 2011. And uh, just to let your my other fellow panelists know, uh, you know, I saw that attack in uh, Norway as a blueprint for potential terrorists in the future for mass shootings. Uh, and I actually, uh, that attack coincided with my very first media appearances. Uh, so I do realize the gravity of that attack and, and how horrific it was and uh, what a national crisis uh, that was. Um, but basically what happened, uh, you know, I told you these two things, the unprecedented election of uh, first African-American president coupled with the downturn in the economy. Uh, there's some other little factors like you know troops returning home, having the inability to find jobs or not having their, uh, you know, getting proper health care for their needs and things of this nature all kind of converged into this uh, new wave of right wing extremism that we're still experiencing uh, here in 2021. And what makes this wave different than what we saw back in the 90s when I first started uh, looking at this as a young, uh, you know, impressionable uh, student at college as well as a government employee was the incubation period between, you know, Ruby Ridge and Waco, which were these two uh, controversial law enforcement actions against uh, extremists that resulted in deaths on both sides. Uh, the new militia movement emerged, more white supremacists emerged, sovereign citizens and all these other extremists. There was only a two year incubation period, two to three years uh, between Ruby Ridge and what culminated in the Oklahoma City bombing uh, in 1995. Here we've had 11, 12 years of growth. So these groups and movements are stronger. They have larger recruit bases. Uh, we're talking hundreds of thousands of Americans that, 
you know, support white supremacy. Uh, there was a recent survey just for the state of Oregon, 40% of the people surveyed agreed with white supremacist uh, ideas, such as establishing a homeland, separating the races, things in this nature. 40% of the people surveyed, they surveyed like, I think 3000 people. Um, so, you know, as far as what white supremacy has done uh, in the past 10, 12 years here in America, it's grown year after year. And we continue to have attacks against minority communities, faith-based communities, uh, and each year or every other year, we have like what's a multi, like a major uh, type of attack. Uh, the very first one we had uh, that I would consider kind of a mass casualty attack uh, was the Sikh temple shooting in 2012. We had six people killed. They were mistaken as Muslims. They were actually Hindu Sikh uh, worshipers at their uh, temple up there in Oak Creek. And then a few years later, we had the Charleston uh, shooting uh, where nine uh, African-American worshipers were killed there. And then that was followed by, you know, another attack where we had, you know, 11, 12 people. And then now we're all the way to 2019, uh, 2010, we had the, or 20, I think it's 2018 was the Jewish synagogue in Pittsburgh where we had 11 killed there. Uh, and then of course, El Paso was the, um, had 23 victims that died uh, in that attack. So we've seen kind of this escalation of the body count and the number of people that are being killed and injured in these types of attacks. Um, and then just one last thing I'll say, um, you know, our attackers here in the United States, uh, you know, I'm not aware of them referencing Anders Breivik uh, and any of manifestos or anything like that, but I do know they take note of world uh, events and they're watching and seeing what their fellow white supremacists are doing in other countries and taking inspiration. They might not do the exact same tactics, uh, but they're definitely getting a call to action uh, when they see these types of attacks uh, being held overseas. Thank you so much for that response. Um, and then this is just a overarching question for anyone. Um, if you could speak to what does white supremacy look like globally today? Um, and how are respective governments sort of addressing it um, today? Well, for a long time, uh, we were asked this question at Homeland Security. Uh, this is, you know, 12 years ago. And primarily we, we found kind of this, uh, symbiotic relationship between extremists in Europe and, you know, white supremacists here. And it was more of a support type thing where, you know, in America, we don't have any laws or prohibitions against, you know, printing Nazi uh, flags and memorabilia. And so extremists in Germany and other countries where that's banned, uh, they would seek out American uh, manufacturers to sell them those materials and to make them for them. Uh, similarly, uh, you know, white supremacist music uh, was being shared. There were bands in Europe coming here to America to play uh, some of their hate rock at some of our venues and vice versa. Our American bands were going over there. Uh, so we didn't see like a lot of coordination as far as violence or, uh, you know, groups having different chapters in multiple countries. But today, fast forward to today, we're seeing that very dynamic taking place. Uh, this has become a globalized movement where people in other countries that have sympathies towards the white supremacy cause are taking, uh, you know, hints and looking at their fellow counterparts in other countries and seeing what they're doing. And uh, there, there's much more coordination and networking going on. Uh, so I'm happy to say, um, that, that has led for the US government uh, to actually have other agencies get involved in looking at this threat where before they were prohibited uh, from doing it uh, because their mission statements were against collecting on US citizens. But when you can have a foreign a nexus to a foreign group or other individuals uh, that opens the door for other uh, people to get involved in the investigations. So maybe Lila, uh, if I could chip in, 
something related. I think your question was about the global aspects uh, and the globalization. And <clears throat> what we're trying to look at in the project I mentioned on global Islamophobia is how connections are being made between uh, both individuals, but also, but mostly movements and organizations between different cultures. Say, for instance, um, <clears throat> you have um, anti-Muslim, anti-Islamic movements in India teaming up with um, um, anti-Islamic movements in Europe and in the US. Um, so you, you have a sharing between you know, uh, India, Southeast Asia, Sri Lanka, Myanmar, of course, uh, Western Europe and, and the US uh, in terms of <clears throat> framing uh, the Muslim population as the main enemy. And, and, uh, and this is something that we believe is, has sort of accelerated, um, maybe not surprisingly, um, um, in, the, in the last couple of decades. And um, it's quite, uh, uh, it's a frightening um, development, uh, I think, but but this is at least one one aspect of of I think um, what you asked Lila about what it looks like today. Um, I also wanted to ask uh, Daryl about um, I think what you also sometimes should talk about is the gender aspect because if you look at some of the attacks here and, and also the you know, the ideology of Breivik himself, that there's a big uh, dimension of gender ideology there. It's fiercely anti-feminist. Uh, there's something about the, the male, uh, the role of the man uh, being, has, has been uh, crushed, undermined. Uh, and this is part of the breakdown of, of Western civilization, that, that the Western man a white man has lost his role in the family. And, and I think this is um, has to do with many things, has to, has to do with how actually Western societies have become much more liberal in terms of women's rights, also gay, gay rights in the past couple of three decades, perhaps. Uh, and this is a major threat to, to, to some of these uh, ideologues. And uh, so, so how is that in, in the US, Daryl? Uh, we have some US colleagues um, connected with, with CREX, the Center for Research on Extremism, who, 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 who do research on masculinity and, and far right. But, and I think that's also something that should be discussed. Yeah, we're definitely seeing that. It's always been a core tenet of uh, right-wing extremism here in America that the male you know, patriarchal order, uh, male supremacy, uh, this has merged or emerged as a kind of a new movement too called uh, the involuntary celibates, incels. And we've had a number of individuals who've been arrested for plots to, uh, for you know, wanting to kill women. Uh, we've actually had a couple of mass shooters that embrace these types of beliefs. Canada also has had a uh, you know, vehicle ramming attack where they charged the individual with terrorism for having these types of views. Uh, we had a um, movie uh, house shooting down in uh, Louisiana a few years ago. Uh, this guy's name, last name was Hauser, and he shot and killed two women and one of their husbands in a movie theater, and he embraced uh, some of these beliefs. So definitely on the radar, it's an emerging threat. It does fall on the far right of the political spectrum. Uh, there may be other you know, people on the far left that have similar type views, but it's predominantly you know, associated with the far right. Uh, now, if I could chip in uh, to, to Daryl's comments, I, I, I think it's absolutely crucial uh, that there is, you know, leadership in, in confronting uh, also in, in the open political arena, uh, right wing extremism and white supremacist ideology and and in that respect i think norway is in a, in a better place than than the us um i'm i'm, I'm thinking here about quite a telling incident because uh, uh, i i think you know norway is in in most respects quite peripheral in 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 us imaginaries right so there's this idea about the second world war <laughs> Courageous Norwegians, uh, you know, 
uh, arming themselves and taking to, to the woods in order to fight the uh, occupying Nazis, which was only half the story, right? Because uh, Norwegian, there were plenty of Norwegian collaborators. Uh, the number, uh, the ratio of Norwegian uh, Jews, uh, Jews uh, killed uh, uh, in, in the Holocaust were, were higher than most other uh, occupied Western European countries. Uh, and 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 so there is a uh, a line of, of of kind of denial here. But but what I was getting at here is that in in uh, white supremacist uh, imaginaries, uh, Norway and the Nordic countries, I think, are pretty much seen as this uh, uh, white uh, homogeneous uh, uh, societies. Which is, on the face of it, and and you know, in in the societies in which we actually find ourselves, and have found ourselves since the nineteen uh, seventies, uh, it's not really the case. Norway has an immigrant population of 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 seven uh, seventeen point eighteen uh, percent, if you include immigrants and and descendants, right? Uh, in the Norwegian capital of Oslo, that rises to uh, some thirty six point eight percent. Um, and, 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 and this was, you know, that these ideas are more widespread than, uh, within white supremacist, uh, circles where it brought home to us when, uh, former US president Donald Trump, uh, made this, uh, uh famous remark during Norwegian prime minister, conservative prime minister, uh, Mrs. Anna Solberg's uh, state visit to the White House in, in January uh, 2018, when he referred to off the record to staff as uh, Norway as a place from which um, uh, the US needed more immigrants, uh, rather than so called shithole countries like Haisha and uh, Haichi and, and, and places in Africa. Uh, and so that spoke to an idea of Norway as 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 being all white, which is really not the case um, any longer, if it was ever the case. Thank you, Dr. Bonstad. Um, I do. I'm noting that we have just about six minutes left. With that said, actually, do you all? I, I know that you're. I know, especially for our Norwegian panelists, you guys are working on like a very late schedule at the moment, but could I maybe request five more minutes and that's the same for attendees, just because I honestly, I think a conversation like this, it's hard to do it within just an hour. Um, so would that be okay with all of you? Excellent. Yeah, sure. And Excellent. And um, Grace, I, I've noticed that you have added a question in there. We will be getting to that just in a minute. I have just one more question and then Grace, I will go ahead and ask yours. Um, so I think what you just said, Dr. Bronstad, br brings me just seamlessly to my final question. Um, what debates are happening? Like what kind of policy debates are happening today within counterterrorism approaches, within counterterrorism policy, um, both within the US government, Daryl, that would be for you to answer. And then also within the Norwegian government, are there concerted efforts to build equity into terrorism policy? And like when I say equity, what I mean is, and this is something Dr. Brecke you touched upon is that there have been there has been a noted hyper focus on um, targeting uh, any kind of like perceived jihadist terrorism um, through our counterterrorism policy, and that's the same within the U.S. So, has there been any kind of effort to actually build equity into terrorism policy in terms of treating white nationalist violence, terrorism arising from that? on par with any other form of terrorism? So if, if I, I mean, my answer to that will be quite brief, simply because I'm not an expert on counterterrorism, and I'm sure that Daryl can, can fill in on the US side. So the only thing, well, I know is from, you know, the, the normal public documents and the, the Norwegian, um, police intelligence services, they um, see right-wing uh, extremism as uh, the most important uh, terrorist threat alongside jihadism today. That's, that's the assessment of the threat. Those are the two, 
those are uh, referenced as the two most important threats uh, to uh, uh, internal security threats to Norway today. Um, but um, uh, I, I only know the researcher side and, and the center that I represent today, CIREX, was of course set up uh, in 2016. A um, uh, very large scale funding and so on, in sim par partly in order to generate a knowledge base about uh, right wing extremism, so as to 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 have a, lo a long term impact on 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 the knowledge base uh, in order to handle that challenge and that threat. So from from the research side, for me as a researcher. That is, that is a good thing because, of course, there is a lot of dialogue between that research community and the police services about what we know, what, what do we know about what's going on, you know, um, here. So, so, so that was my short answer. And, and the actual inside the black box of counterterrorism, I, I simply don't know. <laughs> Yeah, here in the United States, uh, there's anywhere from 10 to 12 pieces of legislation that's been proposed. Uh, none of them have been uh, voted on into law yet, but they fall into two camps. Uh, you've got the penalty enhancement domestic terrorism statutes, and you have the uh, statutes that deal with delineating roles and responsibilities among agencies. Uh, so let me speak to the latter. I think that uh, Dick Durbin's Domestic Terrorism Prevention Act of 2021 is much needed piece of legislation because we do have a lot of interagency turf battles uh, when it comes to domestic terrorism. The FBI is, you know, the number one counterterrorism investigative agency here in America, but there's other federal law enforcement agencies and Homeland Security can also play a role in threat assessment as well as arresting and investigating people that fall under their respective jurisdictions. So I'm in favor of that type of legislation. Uh, it also mandates an annual report uh, by the government to show how many you know, domestic terrorism cases and incidents there have been, what types of weapons are these people uh, possessing, things of this nature. The penalty enhancement one's a lot more complicated and controversial. Uh, of course, you have civil rights organizations that oppose it because time and time again, whenever the US government has been given more powers to fight terrorism, it's always been used against minority populations, uh, according to their perception. Uh, but then you have you know, the FBI and you know, other law enforcement agencies, US attorneys calling for uh, you know, new laws so that they can add penalty enhancements to people convicted of domestic terrorism. We have laws on the books to prosecute foreign terrorists for acts of terrorism on US soil. We do not have a domestic terrorism law uh, that has the same penalty enhancements as those associated with foreign terrorists. And then lastly, I'll say that the uh, incoming administration uh, put forth the very first strategic plan the US government has ever put together to look at domestic terrorism. And I applaud that effort. And uh, I'm glad to see that finally some presidency finally took this seriously and has a plan, uh, you know, that they're going to roll out. I mean, there's going to be hiccups along the way. It's not a perfect thing. We're going to learn and they may shift uh, the strategic plan year after year, but at least we have something. And it's the very first time that that's ever happened related to domestic terrorism. Can I add a little note on, on the Norwegian case? I mean, the uh, July 22nd commission uh, that Professor Brecker uh, referred to uh, actually noted um, that um, uh, that the police security services in Norway had been, so to speak, blind on the right wing, on the right eye. Uh, ahead of of uh, Breivik's terrorist attacks, right? So there there is a recorded incident in which uh, representatives of the Norwegian Centre Against Racism, uh, in a meeting with the police security services uh, taking place in two thousand and nine, um, called for in, uh, increased attention and focus on on the threat threat of right wing extremism and white supremacism in 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 Norway. Uh, I think it's fair to say that, um, uh, or it's a matter of actual record, that uh, 
in the uh, Police Security Services Annual Open Threat Assessment, which are publicly available documents, uh, last year, 2020, was the first year on record that the terrorist threat from right-wing extremism in Norway was put on par with uh, that of Salafi jihadism, or in, in the terminology uh, preferred by the police security services, uh, radical uh, Islamism. Uh, and so that bespeaks uh, a, a lack of uh, equity in, in, in their approaches to counterterrorism, uh, which many of us have over the years been critical uh, uh, about. And it has to be mentioned in this context, of course, that uh, Breivik's terrorist attack was followed by the rise of ISIS, right? Uh, and, and so a real and very tangible um, terrorist threat that emerged uh, and, and was uh, also a real threat uh, in Norway uh, between 2012 and 2016. And the, the uh, legislative changes that uh, Parliament made uh, in introducing uh, specific uh, terrorism legislation, uh, outlawing foreign fighting um, and recruitment to terrorist organizations abroad, uh, which was introduced in, uh, in 2012. Uh, it's Norwegian General P uh, Penal Code 147, 46 and 147 which has led to a number of convictions for uh, returned Norwegian foreign fighters uh, who joined ISIS in Iraq and Syria, uh, was introduced not as a consequence of Breivik's terrorist attacks, uh, but uh, as a consequence of the rise of ISIS as a terrorist uh, uh, threat. But I do think that uh, the way things are going, I'll be surprised if the police security services in Norway uh, in its next year's uh, open threat assessment uh, doesn't rate uh, right-wing extremism uh, higher as a terrorist threat than, than uh, Salafi jihadism. Thank you, Dr. Bangsad. Actually, um, along those lines, we have a question from um, an attendee who's asking, in Norway, have there been any efforts to address police brutality, which is rooted in white supremacist ideology? as a form of domestic terrorism. And I just request that the answer be kept to 30 seconds if possible. And if not, just, just 45 seconds if possible. I know it's a, it's a heavy question, but go ahead. Yeah. Well, the long and, and the short of it is that um, police officers in Norway are very well-educated and they're paid uh, much better salaries compared to uh other professions than uh, is the case in in the us so we don't have anything similar of the levels of, of police brutality against uh black and minority populations uh seen in in the us uh you know we uh police killings are really rare in 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 norway uh, that's not to say that it hasn't happened and that uh, you know, ethnic and racial profiling uh, doesn't happen in uh, Norway and on the part of Norwegian police, uh, but it's much less of uh, a, a problem uh, than than in the US, obviously. Thank you, Dr. Bangsad. Um, final question from one of our attendees, and this is from Grace Harrington. Um, she did have to jump off, but we will be sharing the recording. Um, what is the role of non-Muslim community members in creating a safer community for our Muslim neighbor, family, and friends? And well, I'm not sure we should answer that, but, but uh, well, it's a big question. I think that we um, do have certain uh, mechanisms uh, in place that have been in place for quite a few years where, where there is facilitation of really quite extensive dialogue between the different faith communities and their leaders. Uh, so if you, depends how we look, but if you look at the leadership in the mosques, in the various Christian churches, 
and the synagogues in the temples, Hindu Buddhist te temples, etc. If, if you look at the leadership, you will see that Norway has uh, uh, emphasized, really emphasized, uh, to have strong dialogue uh, on that level, and that that has really worked. Um, and 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 we've seen the um, the positive sides of that uh, in crisis, such as. 22nd July and, and other types of crisis where you have seen, I mean, I could only say like today uh, in one of the services today, commemoration services, there was uh, a, a very influential, important imam in the main church in Oslo speaking together with the, with the priest. So, so there's a lot of uh, dialogue on that level. But if you look at the more local level, uh, um, then I guess that the, the picture is is um, is not so easy to exp I mean, it's it's uh, it's much more nuanced. Uh, there are plenty of differences. Um, you, you would find that in 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 throughout Norwegian society. Um, yeah. Thank you. So, if I might, may I add here that. The yeah. Norway is is generally a society characterized by high levels of, of of trust, you know, horizontal and vertical trust between uh, people and between people and and the state. Uh, and the Norwegian state is is historically and generally seen as a force of good. Uh, and so that that's an important form of of social uh, capital also in in dealing with uh, these kinds of, 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 of challenges. And in my own work, I, I do a lot of work and I have a lot of contacts uh, with uh, young Muslims uh, in, uh, you know, living in, in mainly in the eastern parts of Oslo, uh, the capital. And, and uh, for want of a better word, um, their, uh, you know, everyday experiences is about what my, my great friend, uh, Professor Paul Gilroy would refer to as conviviality. In other words, learning to live with difference. Uh, and I'm actually quite encouraged by a lot of what I've see, uh, I'm seeing on an everyday level of, of kind of practical uh, accommodations and, and everyday neighbor, uh, neighborliness uh, between people of all colors and, 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 and creeds. And, and that is also, you know, the experience of the so-called Utøya generation. They, to me, represent the future of uh, Norway as a multicultural society, because Norway, whether, you know, white supremacists like it or not, uh, multicultural and multi-religious Norway is here to stay and for good. Thank you, and just to build upon what was already said, I think the networking between different religious leaders is, you know, spot on. Uh, they could invite, you know, leaders from different faiths to come into your congregation and dispel stereotypes and myths and other you know, fears that people may have against other religions. Uh, and then especially when the hate crime occurs or some sort of vandalism or, you know, a family of a certain faith is targeted in your community, these other faith leaders should come in and out, you know, condemn it together uh, and vice versa and support each other when an act of violence occurs against their churches or their, you know, members of their congregation. Thank you. No, absolutely. I agree. And that is actually something that impact is very much invested in the interfaith work, essentially, um, and preventing hate crimes. Uh, so with that said, um, we have arrived at the conclusion. I know that we have been a bit over time, but like I said, this is an incredible, incredible and incredibly significant, heavy discussion. And I do think that we ought to continue discussions like this. And, and um, you know, Daryl, Dr. Rangstad, Dr. Brecker, I, I've, I've already said this to you before starting the panel, even that we definitely should continue engagement. Um, with that said, I think we can all agree that white supremacy is very much global in nature, but it does need to be given the level of um, given the level of attention that it deserves as an as an actual terrorism like issue of terrorism. So that being said, I'm glad um, Daryl that you brought up 
Senator Durbin CTPA. So that is actually uh, a piece of legislation that UNPAC itself also supports, and especially because it does not have a domestic terrorism statute. We, in our latest report, um, the double standards of US FTO versus DTO prosecution. So FTO is foreign terrorist organization and DTO is domestic terrorist organization. We have stated that we actually want to push back against a domestic terrorism statute because there are 51 existing statutes on terrorism that exist today. And in our report, we extensively highlight how those existing statutes um, and laws can be applied to actually prosecute instances of domestic terrorism and instances of domestic terrorism carried out by RMVEs, racially motivated violent extremists. So I'm gonna send a link to that here so everyone can access it. Um, and then we'll also send that over in our recap email as well alongside the recording and the deck. But yeah, we identified that there is very much a clear double standards which we have been discussing, which all of our panelists have touched upon in today's conversation between how our governments, how our pol policymakers approach um, terrorism committed by white supremacists versus terrorism that's committed by say someone who is of a particular color or who's of a particular religious background. Yes, go ahead, Daryl, I see you. I just have one parting thought. Um, this whole panel is focused on, you know, the racially motivated white supremacists, but you need to also include the anti-government militias, uh, plots like, you know, what we saw out in Kansas uh, with the militia members targeting the Somali Muslim community with the vehicle bomb plot. Uh, the actual pipe bombing of a mosque up in Minnesota by militia members. So there are other actors on the far right that are not technically white supremacists, but a more paramilitary an organization uh, that you need to be aware of as well as a threat. Thank you. And actually, as you're saying that, I know that this has come up in our policy team discussions before, but I'm making even special note of that um, because I do think that there haven't, and to my knowledge, there haven't been as many reports published on that particular issue. White supremacy has been getting more attention, but paramilitary organizations have not been getting as much attention, despite, as you said, what's happened in Kansas. And I think even they were the same groups, aside from white supremacists who were involved in the January 6th insurrection. Um, so yeah, like I said, I think that this is very much an important, important discussion. And I would very much like to stay in touch with all of you. Um, Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us here today. And I look forward to speaking with you again. Thank you, Prema and Leela. Thank you very much. Thank and you. thank you to, uh, to all of you uh, from me as well. Thank you. And special shout out to Leela. She has honestly put so much work and effort into organizing this. So thank you. And MPAC is very much proud of her. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you all for coming to this panel today. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Take care.